This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? Hello, hello. Hey. I missed y'all. Yeah. Did we not talk last week? It didn't feel like it. <laughs> uh, I guess we really, yeah. We haven't talked just the three of us in a while because we've been guest heavy. Yeah. It's been a good series good, of guests, though. Yeah. DHH's episode broke the record for fastest downloaded episode previously held by DHH. Oh, nice. <laughs> and cool. when this aired, it's two weeks ago since it went out or whatever, a week and a half. And it's already our like top episode ever. So it like tripled our average downloads in two days or something. It, it was nuts. This Super happened cool. before when he came on last time, like <laughs> Transistor was like, wow, your subscriber count doubled and then I had to watch it like slowly come back down because yeah. it like guesses that based on the first 24 hours of downloads it's not yeah, cause, exact science because all the podcast hosts love to cash them themselves and not really <laughs> share any real analytics yeah we're talking to you Spotify and Google we yes. know what you do you take our file and then you make a copy of it and then you host your file the only way to get our analytics is by using your platform and we're not happy about it. Okay. Anyway, so (laughs) (laughs) very anti the man this week. I feel like the internet has riled me up. You look very anti the man, the the beard and the long hair. I mean, I look like a crazy person because I just spent four or five hours in Dante's callback Inferno. (laughs) (laughs) I know you're really salty about callbacks. I've been actually embracing them again. It's weird because I was anti-callback for a long time. Yeah, I was going to say like 99% of my code is callbacks. I just put everything in there in one callback. I'm totally fine with callbacks. <laughs> but I had often heard that callback hell. Now, people said things to me and at one point at RailsConf, I made a slight fool of myself because I was like, we don't use callbacks everywhere on our app. And they were like, you don't? And I was like, no. And this was probably four months into me learning Rails. And my coworker was like, yeah, we do. It's not good either. And so that was fun. And I was like, nah, the callbacks aren't bad. But today I I brushed up against a bad string of callbacks. And now I know. Now I've been burnt. Oh, I've definitely been burned by them. Yeah, it's one of those ones where you have to like, you end up going too far in one direction or the other and the nice middle is the one that's like hard to learn but that's actually where you want to be you can use them for some things and like the hot wire example i thought was a good one like anytime this model gets updated broadcast the change that's not bad it's not going to break anything and it's nothing depends on that either so it's nice in that case but it's also very easy to go make some nasty callback that you can't Mm -hmm easily turn off or something and you need to for some weird import that you end up having to do. The fabled user import. And then all of a sudden your email server gets flooded with a bajillion emails and everything goes on fire. I've never done it personally, but I've laid witness several times. The other day I was creating an account at Podia in development and I didn't get the email and I was like, Huh. And I checked my inbox and I actually had an email from Podia and I was gripping my desk. How did this happen? Like I have to let the team know, but I don't want to scare them. And then I realized I was just actually on app.podia.com when I did it. But like, I was panicked that we had turned on emails and development and were running everything. Funny story at an unnamed company, they had production emails on in development. And had been that way for many years. Dope. And I was like, absolutely not, please. I, my, my style of programming is not conducive to this. That's funny. Yeah, I can imagine. It'd be really cool if you could look back and see just how many came from development. <laughs> if there was a way to search that and see, it would be a fascinating thing to, to be like, wow, somebody sank down the production database, was testing something, and they just spanned the hell out of this guy. Poor user. Chris, you launched a new free course on getting started with Rails. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Ever since the beginning of Go Rails, it was like, it was always intermediate content. 
And I've always wanted to do some beginner stuff, but it's actually funny because it seems like extra hard to go build beginner content when you know HTTP really well and how cookies work and DNS and whatever. And then you got to like go back and explain it. And you're like, honestly, I can't explain an association without talking about Ruby classes and inheritance and metaprogramming and then databases. And I don't know how much SQL, you know, and the difference between SQLite and MySQL and Postgres and whatever. So it's always felt like a really big rabbit hole to go down. I tried to start from the very basics and like, here's HTTP and like just a very simple intro to it and not dive in too deep and like give you a pointer of like, go read MDN's docs about HTTP or cookies or whatever it is and just go through and build a simple, but also real and complex app at the same time. So the app that I did in 41 videos so far was a tweet scheduler. We build probably, it feels like half of it was building authentication from scratch, talking about routes and how they connect to a controller and an action and setting your session cookie and logging in, resetting your password and so on. And then the rest of it ramps up and gets a little bit more complex where you have to connect to OAuth and go set up your Twitter account and then model tweets in your database that are unpublished and they have a time. And then you create a background job to run that post, but maybe you rescheduled it. So we got to check and make sure that this job, we're not going to go delete the job. We're going to let it run. It just will be self-aware so that it can say, oh, I don't need to do anything because you rescheduled it. And just talk about all of those things that you have to think about in like a, a real app. And that idea actually came out of, I think somebody that I was talking to, probably Andrea was talking about, that was one of the coding challenges to do at some job for an interview. And I was like, oh, that's a really good idea. It's just complicated enough. And so, yeah, I sat down over somewhere, I think it was after Christmas between that and New Year's and sat down and like just cranked out for two or three days of tons of videos and redid all this stuff. And earlier this week, I finished up like deploy it to Heroku and then we'll make some changes and deploy those to Heroku and we'll fix a bug on production and show it some more real world stuff. But yeah, that's, that's how the course turned out. Touche on deploying to Heroku instead of Hatchbox. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> free tier is can't compete with that. So it's funny though, because I was, also working on a deploy to Heroku button for Jumpstart. And I guess the Redis version six on Heroku now requires us to sell in the higher tiers, but it's a self-signed cert. So Redis can't actually validate the certificate and connect to it automatically, which is what? It's really strange that Heroku's Redis doesn't have a valid cert. Like I would think that they would be able to add that cert into their dyno like Ubuntu image. And it would just automatically be valid, even if it is self-signed. But no, apparently not, at least at the moment. So yeah, Heroku, I love them and also am frustrated by them all the time. It's, it's tough. Uh, yes, the undocumented environment variable has bitten me more than once. I have one joke and then I have one actual question. Number one, I'm very upset because the length of your series is four hours and 24 minutes. So I'm going to need you to cut out four minutes somewhere. And <laughs> my actual question is because it's hard to know like what people don't know essentially about Rails, right. especially after you have been doing it for so long. It's, oh yeah, you just throw a pry in there, get a pry in there and someone's, what's that? And you're like, oh, some yep. people don't know about that. So did you actually like talk to people who are newer in Rails to figure this out? Or do you have a sense of it just because of where you're at in the community and surrounded by kind of those types of voices? Yeah, I did it on a sense of it, mostly just to get it done. And my thinking there was like, look, it's 41 videos right now, but like, there's no reason I can't go splice in a video and say, Hey, in that last video, we talked about binding.irb. What is that? And I can go in and add that as people comment or whatever and raise questions as they go. I figured it could be kind of a living course for that reason. And hopefully there aren't like bugs or whatever that require me to rewrite 
a video. That's the hard part about that. And that's where the written Rails tutorial that Hartle has is really nice because you can go just edit that and boom, he's done. No re-recording for the most part. But he does have videos, so I guess he might have to too. I assume you did not use Webpacker. <laughs> no, and actually we just copy and paste the CDN JavaScript and CSS for Bootstrap and call it a day. Because I, I was like, we're not going to even talk about the asset pipeline or Webpacker or any of this stuff because it's not really relevant. The focus here is learning Rails. And yeah, I didn't really get into what's the difference between a symbol and a string and why does Rails look for this being plural here or whatever. I kind of talked a little bit about it, but not like super thoroughly. So I'm sure there's lots of things like associations. I was like, I assume you know SQL a little bit and just glossed over that. But maybe I'll go back in and add, here's a database. Here's what a table looks like. Here's how we can combine two tables in a query and, and search for the user's tweets or whatever. But for the most part, I, I tried to stick to some, I assume you know some programming. You probably need to know a little bit of Ruby. And if you don't, you'll get by just fine, but you won't quite understand why. What a before action with a symbol is. I do think I said, this is able to see that symbol and then go find a method with the same name. And it didn't go super deep into why that works, but you probably don't need to know at the beginning. If you decide to make a course on SQL, I will be renewing my Go Rails subscription. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I don't really consider myself that great at SQL. When you get into complicated queries or even like sub queries and stuff, I don't really have a lot of apps that need that right now. So I've never really dove into that too deeply. So I don't think I would even be a good teacher for that. I could do all the basics, none of the semi-complicated stuff. SQL is actually a thing I've thought about making a course on. SQL for Active Record, like for Rails developers specifically. You should. Yeah, that would be good. Some crazy stuff with a Rel, and it was cool. And I still barely understand it, but you should do it, Jason. Please. I will help you if you want. Yeah, I, I, think, I would love that. I think a lot of people feel like I do. They're like comfortable with the basics. They probably haven't written actual SQL queries for a long time. You don't have to in Rails, even with ARel, but you do have to understand what you're trying to write. And yeah, I think it would be really valuable to have a fairly intermediate course on that stuff, just because there's a lot to it. Even the different types of joins can be confusing. So just talking about inner joins and left joins and whatever and how those work can be really useful, I think. Yeah, you have inspired me. I was talking to Chris last week. I'm almost wrapped up with my stimulus reflex course. And I think I'm going to do something else. And I was thinking about doing a mini test course, but a SQL course would actually be hella valuable too. So I don't know. I feel like people would definitely spring for the SQL course over a mini test course personally, just because I feel like you can get up into years in Rails and still not really know SQL. Personally, I can do basic stuff, but I don't write SQL for fun. Honestly, the other day I found like a basically a wrapper around SQL, a desktop app that just was like a CSV, but in your database, which is basically what Airtable is. But I was like, yeah, I would rather do this than write SQL. So I feel like a lot of people at varying levels, not just junior, would be like, yeah, this is something that I would want to know about. Especially if you touched on ARL, which is like the hidden power of active record, but it's scary. Yeah, that's interesting. You've swayed me in a matter yeah. of seconds. Yeah, I think it'd be a really good one. And SQL applies to probably way more people because everybody talks about how prolific our spec is in, in most Rails jobs. I think it, it's got a wider audience, which is good. Speaking of mini test, I put up a bare bones site that needs some examples for bettermini-test.com, just trying to organize examples of like, how do you go test in a system test, subdomains, and then a controller test and an integration test and just get some best practices and just lots of examples because they're really, it's really hard to find good mini test examples. So I do think that's something, a mini test course and 
getting a good set of examples on, on the site would help a lot of people pick it up because it's the GHH stack built into Rails and it doesn't get enough credit, almost probably because it's too simple. Like you want to learn something complex and do complex tests. And it's like, it's actually, it's actually really straightforward. Like I just wrote a test for doing a post request as a turbo stream format. And I was like, are you serious? It's this easy, just as and the symbol of turbo stream and that's it. And I have to do your content type or anything and it figures it out and, and does that for you. And I was like, wow, there's a lot to document though, I think, because there's just so much. I've worked on several applications at this point, and I've noticed that regardless of the business or application, there are a few support requests that you will inevitably see at one point or other. Is the site down? I was supposed to get that email and I, it never came. And inevitably something doing with the cache. And with Honey Badger, you can answer all of these questions and more. You don't need a fleet of different monitoring tools for just your cron or your front end and your back end. Get all the answers to whether that scheduled task for that email ran without an error, the site speed and whether there's a problem, which users are being affected if there is a problem, and what specific error is causing that issue. Set up in minutes or click the one button on Heroku. It's that easy. I literally did it right before this recording. Give Honey Badger a try. Let them know Remote Ruby sent you. And be like Honey Badger with no cares because you know they have your back 24-7. Jason, I heard you were doing some cool stuff this week as well. I saw lots of blasts about your new editor that you've been hinting at over the past several months. You want to spill the beans? Yeah. So I've been like, talking about it quite a bit, but just not calling it the editor. So we rebuilt our site editor at Podia and we started this project back in July. And basically the one we had was all stimulus. View logic in Haml, view logic in JavaScript. It wasn't really sustainable for us. So yeah, we reapproached how we built it and started off by trying to do a purely stimulus reflex version of it that did not work as well as we anticipated. We ended up with a mixture of React and Cable Ready. So it's been fun. What specifically about stimulus reflex wasn't working for you? Because I feel like I love reflex because I have a long history of it and I love Nate, but I feel like it's important to talk about, like there are downsides to using it. So if you have any good examples, what were some of the things that prompted you to kind of rely more heavily on cable ready, which is arguably more of the, the back end almost of stimulus reflex? Yeah. So the problem was when you're building an, a site editor, typically like when somebody's typing to like a text field, you want that to live update and using stimulus reflex, that's going to require at most every keystroke to go to the server and re-render. And at best, you can wait till the user's done typing, but then it doesn't feel instant anymore. Uh, it doesn't feel real time. So the problem we had was we thought, what if we could just define our view logic in one place? So instead of having to write it in ERB and JavaScript, what if we could just write a view component and re-render that view component? And it like mostly worked, but as you worked on more complex functionality, it just got more complex. So it was like... Okay, we're going to, like when a user types or does something, we're going to go to the server and re-render it. If we do that, though, maybe we have to hit the database each time. That's going to be a bottleneck. Okay, what if we sent an entire form over of just params and rebuilt our view component just made itself out of params? I got really messy really fast. And then when you start dealing with like associations when you're doing that, you've got like params that are nested like three or four levels deep. It's just not sustainable. So for us, it started off simpler conceptually. It started to kind of fall apart. So it didn't like mitigate our use of stimulus reflex at Podia. It just like, this wasn't a good fit because we actually needed like real time updates. We didn't want to have to rely on a round trip to the server every time a user did something. I feel like that makes total sense. And honestly, I wouldn't use Reflex for that either. We're trying to, like I said, mitigate 
having the same view logic everywhere. It turned out though, as much as we don't reach for react, if we have to, this was a perfect case for it. So we actually converted most of our storefront views, like people views for like creators into react components, but that lets us reuse them in our editor. So like if a user is like typing, we can just broadcast an event to react and update its state. And it knows how to re-render like with all the view logic based on data. And it turns out that's actually something reacts like really good at. So like we don't use anything like a state store or anything like that. Like most of the things it takes are just props. And there's a couple of things like text or images we want to swap out. It's been really good for that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense though, because when you're trying to do events in mass like that, like every key press, you're effectively sending, I don't know, quite a few requests per second, probably if, if the user's typing fast and then your Rails app has to regenerate all that and it makes so much more sense for it to be client side for that. And that is the purpose of React or Vue, trying to make those situations feel real time because the round trip to the server is just, it's a lot. And I don't know, I was going to ask if there was any, I don't think there's any guarantees of those happening in order. So it might be possible that you type a word and then the previous one like the last one ran faster and then the previous one took a second longer for whatever reason. And then it shows up as the last result. And it's like the text in your text box doesn't match the te- like header you were editing. I would imagine that is a, like a problem that could happen. And it's less, probably less likely to happen in react then because it's all client side. Yeah. There were a lot of cases like that. Once we figured out that we could essentially like not have to use Redux or anything like that. It became like what our components do is they listen for very specific like Podia events and they're just always listening. And so every time that events fired a page section, Oh, is that for me? And it like inspects it. And it, if it is, then it just grabs its data and updates it. And so what that allowed us to do was basically we built some abstractions around our forms, like in our editor where they're just like stimulus controllers that know how to take those values and broadcast those events out. So like our app is very much just a rails app. And so our editor is very much just like rails with a little bit of react. One other thing. So we actually use cable ready a lot. The reason is like our actual like display of your site is an iframe. And so what we do is we, Every time like you click edit, we actually make just like a Rails remote true to like an edit action. And it actually does a cable ready broadcast back over to the editor, like with the page section. It's cool for us because it was just Rails and it was a way for an iframe to talk to a parent without having to know about each other. Like you just click a link, it renders a partial like cable ready it over. Fun fact, did you guys know that you can lazy load iframes now and it's got like very wide support? Fun fact. Jason, what do you think is like the coolest part about the new editor? Or what are you like the most proud of? I'm curious. The combination of Cable Ready and React because it very much like appealed to our, we want to do the Rails way, but we had to adopt React, but we didn't have to like build the entire thing in React. I think that's the coolest part. How are you guys adding React? Because there's several ways to do it. And there's that React on Rails gem. And there used to be like React Rails was a gem. And you can also do it through Webpacker. And I've seen people do it other ways, which I find very cursed. But how are y'all doing it? So we have two ways of doing it currently because our uh, messaging platform is built in React. This one is using the React Teams, React Rails gem. And so that way, like... Essentially what we do is when we go to render out a section, we're actually rendering it with rails. So like it puts a div in with all the props and then react picks it up. So most of that's extracted away from us, which is nice because before when we did it, it was very much a manual process of we would make a window variable with all the props and then read it in and then render the component. And so that abstraction has been nice. We also have tried doing pre-rendering with react. So like server side rendering, but it's slow. 
Yeah, because what it does is actually starts up a node process. Yeah, and sends it over to render and then responds with HTML and it. <laughs> yeah, the wasn't ideal. service worker in front of it. You're into a whole new can of worms. Yeah. Anyway, so I've just been, I don't know, I've been excited about that because obviously it's been the last six months of my life, but I don't know, it's cool to work through different options. Basically keep a Rails app as Railsy as possible. And like we even do things like dispatch events from Cable Ready. So like some of those really specific React events I've been talking about, like we can send from the server, uh, which is cool. Like we use Wistia for uploading videos. So like if a user uploads a video, we have a kind of Rails abstraction around that and we can just broadcast events when it's done or if a background job runs, we can broadcast an event. And I don't know, it keeps the app very, very snappy feeling, even though it's still, a lot of things are still happening in Rails. It's cool. If you had to rebuild it, like with everything now, would you still use Cable Ready? Yes, today I would. You could you could say no. No, today I would. We would have still had the same problem with Hotwire. We'd have to go to the server first. The fact that Cable Ready is just an open connection basically to the DOM to send JavaScript events or operations from Ruby is, yeah, don't sleep on that. That's cool. That's was, like really powerful. I was going to ask if you thought how big of a difference that was making. It sounds like quite a bit or... As much as you can say without measuring. Yeah. So our old app was very much a lot of UJS. So like when you would create a new page section, we'd go to the server, come back with UJS. We had an abstraction for like rendering the HTML, passing that through the JavaScript and putting it on the page. And now it's as simple as insert HTML, render this partial, and we do it with cable ready. It's maybe a little more Ruby code, but it's a little simpler because at least you can follow it through. Like I know that when I perform this action on rails, this is what I need to happen in the Dom and I like it. I am now currently looking for an excuse to use Podia because now I want to see it. <laughs> that was like the first thing I thought of. I was like, I want to see it. It's gotta be cool. It's gotta make a sequel course. Yeah. <laughs> before Jason does. Yep, there you go. <laughs> right. It's a race. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. I will not be doing that. When you were talking about how are you, loading react i was fiddling with madman the other day and i want to make it compatible with the asset pipeline and webpacker like we've talked about before so i did the sky pack and just wrote a script type as module is that right you do that in your html and then i just pull in stimulus set up a stimulus app and then pull in stimulus flat picker and I wrote stimulus slim select and it worked like magic. I don't think I pulled in any shim for that. So I may need to do that to get compatibility with other browsers that don't have like the import map stuff. But yeah, it was like magic where I'm like, Hey, I now have the ability to include JavaScript and CSS in Madmin, and it's in independent. It doesn't even need any file to be added to your Rails app for for that functionality, which is cool. The only thing that I got to figure out next is I could pull in the Rails JavaScript and action text and the other active storage upload stuff. I could pull that in through Skypack as well. But the problem is you want it to be to match the version that you've got. And I could, I guess I could pull that in and specify the version in the gem file and use that and figure out how to translate it so that it could be the same matching version in Skypack. But I was also thinking it's not hard if I check for Webpacker and just drop in a the exact same file as the application JS that ships with Rails and just include action text and the other active storage JavaScript in there and just include that file, but leave the rest of the stimulus and those things like from Skypack. Seems really promising as a direction to to pull in some assets into a gem that you can customize, but also you don't have to go install and configure the Rails app specifically for your gem. Yeah, I'm excited about that. I'm not sure. You may have seen this, so I'm sorry if you already have, but you can 
do a bunch of stuff with Skypack where you can basically generate a pinned URL that's production optimized and minified and pinned to a specific version of whatever package you're trying to pull in. Mm. So I feel... Yeah, oh yeah, I, with the like the... Because I've used that on Unpackage before where it's like the instead of just specifying the, the package name, it's like package at and the version number. Is that what you're saying? Like a similar thing to that? Yeah. And they have a few other things that you can do. Like you can put like what you just said, and then you can do slash min on it and it will give you a minified file. Oh, really? Um, That's cool. Yeah. Huh. Uh, we'll, we'll put a link yeah. in the show notes. Yeah. Cause I think if I read active storage colon version and can convert that to the matching node version, I know the formats aren't exactly the same it might make sense to do that and then just pull in the JavaScript like that and then not even require a JavaScript pack for Madmin that's just Rails and Turbo or Turbolinks or whatever. And that would be one less file to deal with. What's nice is though, you like you can go and install the view in your app views folder and then just replace the JavaScript, change it, whatever you want to do. It's just a partial now. And so you can include any asset packs that you want, any webpacker packs that you want. It seems like it will be a pretty ideal setup for that. So I'm really excited to to try that out because I think, yeah, that version number, if we can translate from whatever's installed in your gem file to that, and it only gets a little tricky with beta and RC ones and that stuff because the the hyphens and periods are not necessarily the same. But other than that, it might allow me to pull in JavaScript and CSS without any, without installing any files, which is sweet. So SNCC, SNCC.io, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, the security company, the uh, they SN... have a package to convert Ruby version numbers to JavaScript. Oh, really? Uh, but honestly, if I were you, I would just be like, hey, you don't get the RC and the betas. Like, come on. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, I, there's definitely... There's got to be some way to do it reasonably, but does SNCC have that? That's an open source library or something they published. Yes. And I am retrieving it for you as we speak. Cool. Yeah. I've used them once in the past. They're pretty cool. It's neat to see that because there's definitely a lot of the like dependent bot looking at your dependencies, but security stuff is another good one to just have scanning and keeping an eye on things. I thought that was pretty neat. Last week we talked to, about Rails LTS and I guess it was not last week in real life. Last week on the podcast world, on the podcast timeline, Heroku now has a license for Rails LTS to test against old Rails versions for the Ruby build pack. I thought that was awesome. Yeah, that was great. I thought that the episode had come out the week prior and I was like, we did it. And you guys were like, no. And I was like, ah. Yeah, that'd be Maybe cool. Maybe someone else. Or someone knew about our conversation and listened ahead. <laughs> yeah. I was fiddling with a... Tony Drake in the Go Rails community was... He posted a, a question. And I was like, hey, it, is this a bug? And it was on Turbo where... If you render a turbo stream template and that template renders an HTML partial, it'll automatically work unless you use a respond to with the format dot turbo stream block. And he was like, this seems weird. And I was like, no, nah, that makes sense. You specify turbo stream here and you got to change the format because you want to render that partial. But we got looking into it and it's like, Turbo falls back to HTML on a regular request. But when you insert your respond to and specify in a, a specific format, it actually strips it out and it's just turbo formats and not the fallback to HTML anymore. So we got playing with that and figured that out and got a PR merged into Turbo Rails to fix that, where it basically just oh, anytime you call the turbo stream tag in your controller or your views that I'll just double check and make sure that HTML is in the uh, list of formats because that's what you expect. And now it'll take care of that, which is pretty cool. It was like a one-line fix. 
and then 20 lines of tests or something. It's always funny how like you can write the tests. It's such a simple fix. And then it's like a bunch of lines of code for a test. But yeah, I thought that was fun. It was a little, little interesting endeavor to dive into. I've never looked into respond to, and they have this collector object. That's the one that collects the formats that you chose to respond to. And then it looks through that and the mime type registries and whatever. I have not really dove into the action view and rendering stuff in rails before, but there's a lot of stuff and it jumps around quite a bit. So it can be hard to wrap your head around, but was it nice to be able to fix this without touching rails? I thought that was good. I would feel very accomplished if I were you. Actually, I feel accomplished for you that you didn't have to change rails to do that. Very nice. Yeah. Part of me was like, I felt like the ideal solution would be to change the respond to so that it would only on the turbo stream one, you know, add the fallback, but there's no other formats that do that. And then you're inserting some weird exception into rails just for this one mime type. And yeah, it didn't seem quite like the right place, but it did at the same time. So this solution will work well, I think, but yeah, pretty cool. Cool. Well, anything else you guys want to chat about before we wrap it up? Oh, not that I can think of. It's been a busy week. I didn't write it down because why would I write it down? <laughs> I have a milkshake. That's the only thing that comes to mind. And Is that why there's so many boys in your yard? <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> I appreciate the reference, honestly. I think that's a good one. Yes, that is why the boys are in my yard. And if you would like milkshakes, you may want to grab a lawn chair and head down to North Carolina. It could be some milkshake. Oh. Yeah, I, I think that wraps it up, huh? Jason's, <laughs> Jason's disappointed sigh. All right, I'll see you. Wait, before, wait before, <laughs> before we're done, when's the final release of your course coming out, Jason? Serious Reflex? Yes. I'm hoping to start to land it this weekend, next week. I only have three modules left, so. Nice. The good news well. is the episode doesn't come out till later. <laughs> you really have more time. I've got five weeks. So. <laughs> I'm excited. So yeah, folks be- out there, the takeaway from this episode is that Chris is a monster and a cyborg. He made 41 videos just <laughs> off the cuff. <laughs> and Jason's out here churning in courses. So Next. I'm doing things. <laughs> I'm doing things. We're just setting things. the bar high for you. I'm learning SQL. Maybe, as soon as Jason makes that course. I'm reading books. Making it happen. Absolutely. I hope you guys have a great weekend, great next week, and we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, you too. Later. Love you, bye.